much. Um, I was going to sing for my supper, but I don't want to upstage our uh, distinguished honoree. And Judge the Par, I'm so grateful that when Judge Kavanaugh administered my oath, he gave it to me in slightly smaller bites. <laughs> but I thought they did a great job in keeping up with you. Uh, good evening, everyone, and, and thank you so much for the invitation to address uh, this distinguished bar association. For nearly three decades, NAPABA has advocated for Asian Pacific Americans in the legal community and beyond. Your range of initiatives and programs is truly impressive. I especially appreciate your efforts to encourage pro bono representation, something that we did extensively when I was in private practice at Jones Day, as well as to mentor young lawyers and law students and support military service members and veterans. But on a personal note, I want to express my special gratitude to the support that you gave to my nomination as Solicitor General. We lawyers have a, thank you. We lawyers have a special duty of candor. And I recognize that many of you have differences with the current administration. That only makes me more thankful for your support. As I told the Senate during my confirmation hearing, the Solicitor General plays a special role in our system of government. Although he is the chief litigator for the executive, he also has a special duty to serve the interests of the United States as a whole and each and every one of us Americans that comprise it. Serving in that role is the greatest honor of my professional life, and I am so grateful to the support that you gave in helping me to achieve it. I couldn't speak to an audience like this without mentioning my father, who after all is the reason that you all have invited me here tonight. Nemesio Maurice Francisco was born and raised in the Philippines. I'd like to tell you three short stories about him. Stories that I believe will echo those that many of you could tell about your own families. The first story is a story of adversity. My father was born in 1935, and he grew up amidst the ravages of World War II. At that time, the Philippines was a commonwealth, still under the formal control of the United States, but transitioning toward independence. Within hours of the attack on Pearl Harbor, the Philippines was also attacked. As a very young boy, my father once told me how he was driven from his home by invading soldiers, and how for days he and his family was forced to live in the remnants of a bombed out tank. That seven-year-old little boy living in a bombed out tank. My father's family later pooled all of their resources to send him, the youngest son, to medical school and eventually to the United States where he met my mother. And that's of course where my story began. And isn't that the story of many of us? We came here on the shoulders of immigrants who had the courage to cross oceans in search of a better life. The second story is a story about politics, and I mean that in the best sense of that word. I remember my father and mother once having an argument about a political donation that my father made to President Reagan's reelection campaign. My, father learned, my mother learned about it when she got the perfunctory thank you note in the mail along with the auto pen signature of President Reagan. Now, my mother had grown up in a Teamsters household, but I don't think that her objection was to President Reagan's politics. Rather, she just couldn't believe that my father had wasted so much money on a political donation. But my father was so proud of that auto penned photo. And it was only many years later that I think I became and began to understand why? It was because when he received that auto pen photo, that's when he really 
began to understand that he was an American actively participating in our political process, which is, of course, what we all here do on a daily basis. The third story occurred shortly before my father's death in 1989. My father had come to this country with a group of Filipino doctors, and at this point in time, he was dying of lung cancer. The other Filipino doctors and their families, known to us as our aunties, uncles, and cousins, came to say goodbye. And what struck me when we all gathered together was how all of my cousins and I looked alike. And it wasn't just because we all had jet black hair. Yes, at one point my hair was jet black, and we all had brown skin, which we all did have. Rather, it was because in the fashion of the time, every one of us teenage boys had ponytails and earrings. I, I don't think our parents liked it all that much, but what really struck me was how just one generation later, thoroughly American, our families had become. To me, these stories about my father tell a distinctly American story. And I suspect that many of you in this room could tell similar tales. So no matter what else our divisions may be, these stories unite us all for what we are, Americans who love this great country. I wish... I wish my father could have lived to see how his story continued. The other week, I had the honor of speaking at the White House for Filipino American Heritage Month. I was introduced at that time as the highest ranking Filipino American in the administration. And it brought to mind my last stint in government during the administration of President George W. Bush, when I served as a very young lawyer in the White House Counsel's Office. Back then, I had the honor of participating in Philippine President Arroyo's state visit to the United States. And that was because then, as now, I was the highest ranking Filipino American in the administration. The only difference was I really wasn't that high ranking at all. And in a small way, I think that marks progress that we as a community have made. And today we see similar progress across the government. There are now more Asian Pacific Americans, including many more Filipino Americans, in government than ever before. My good friend and colleague and a member of this organization, Neil Katyal, an Indian American, served as the acting Solicitor General for more than a year during the Obama administration. The U new United States Attorney for the District of Columbia, another dear friend, Jesse Liu, is the first Asian Pacific American to hold that prestigious position in Washington, D.C. The nominee for the United States Attorney in Maryland, Robert Hur, is also Asian Pacific American, and so too are President Trump's early Courts of Appeals nominees, Judge Amul Thapar, now on the Sixth Circuit, and Judge Jim Ho, a recent nominee to the Fifth Circuit. And they will have the honor of joining four Asian Pacific Americans that President Obama appointed to the Court of Appeals, including Judge Denny Chin, who I had the great honor of meeting tonight. <laughs> Judge Wynn of the Ninth Circuit Court of Appeals. <laughs> Judge Sri Srinivasan, who I had the great honor of clerking with on the Supreme Court. and Judge Raymond Chen on the Federal Circuit. I suspect that each of these individuals could tell a story similar to my father's and similar to yours. Much of this progress, of course, is due to the advocacy of this organization. I congratulate you. 
I not only congratulate you, but I thank you for these enormous achievements, including on my behalf. So we are rightfully proud of the, achievement, the achievements that we as a community have made. Diversity is extraordinarily important. And I'd like to focus for just a few minutes on another aspect of diversity that often doesn't get as much billing, and that is the diversity of viewpoints. You and I will not always agree. I would submit, however, that that is a good thing, provided that we express our disagreements respectfully and honestly. Diversity of viewpoints is a value that is fundamental to the American legal profession. As we all know from our everyday lives, a diversity of viewpoints produces not only greater understanding, but also more informed decision making. And I have some personal experience with that in my own family life. I happen to be the only Republican in my household. Although I have a little bit of hope for my 10 year old daughter, Maggie. But the same is true when it comes to practicing law. If everyone writing a brief or analyzing a problem thinks the same way, the result is often soft thought. Assumptions aren't tested, counter arguments aren't anticipated, and the product is weaker. In fact, encouraging a diversity of legal viewpoints is not only a desirable practice, it is the foundation of our adversarial justice system. Unlike many countries in the civil law tradition, our legal system is built on the premise that competing viewpoints will sharpen issues and produce better, fairer decisions. Now, of course, the legal system that encourages adversaries to zealously argue against one another creates risks. Advocacy can easily turn into animosity. We unfortunately see this in our daily lives as well. And that is where the importance of civility comes in. As Chief Justice Berger once described it, civility is, and I'm quoting, an indispensable part the lubricant that keeps our adversarial system functioning. Thus, lawyers are taught from the beginning that disagreement does not require disrespect, and that while we often have a duty to our clients to disagree with our adversaries, we also have a duty to our profession to do so with courtesy, respect, and candor. And ultimately, we all have a duty to base our arguments on the rule of law not on personal animosity. The same values define the work of judges. One of the best illustrations of this is the tradition of dissenting opinions. Those of us who practice in appellate courts are very familiar with dissents. They can be particularly valuable when you lose a case, but can at least point your client to one other person who thought you were right. Now, it doesn't always work that way. The Chief Justice uh, often tells a story about when he was in private practice and he argued a case before the United States Supreme Court and lost nine to zero. And his client came to him and said, how on earth could we have lost that case nine to zero? And his response was, well, there were only nine justices. <laughs> but it's worth taking a step back to recognize what a remarkable concept the dissenting opinion is. In many countries in Europe, courts issue a single collective judgment cast in impersonal language. The author is unnamed. Disagreement, if it exists, is not disclosed. The court's decision, at least in theory, gains legitimacy because it is delivered in a single voice. By contrast, our system of justice has included dissenting opinions since the days of Chief Justice John Marshall. The expression of diverse viewpoints through respectful, separate opinions serves many of the same values as our adversarial legal system. As the Supreme Court justices themselves have noted, the presence of a dissent tends to sharpen the majority opinion by ensuring that the most effective counterarguments are aired and considered. And occasionally, the circulation of a proposed dissent can even change the result, thus protecting the public against the possible error that might not have otherwise become apparent. 
I learned much of this firsthand through my clerkship with Justice Scalia, who, you may recall, penned an occasional dissent. <laughs> Justice Scalia had very strong opinions, and not just when it came to law. I still remember my first day clerking for Justice Scalia when he took all of the law clerks to A.V. Restaurante, his favorite pizzeria on Capitol Hill, for lunch. There were five of us total. He ordered four large anchovy pizzas. <laughs> After we'd finished three of the pizzas, we were thoroughly stuffed. But the justice sort of looked down at his plate and kind of mumbled, I couldn't imagine taking my clerks to lunch the first time and not finishing the food. So literally, like a scene out of Cool Hand Luke, we shoved the remaining pizzas into our mouth, moved our jaws up and down, and finished it off. Nothing in Justice Scalia's chambers was ever done halfway. There's plenty that can be said about Justice Scalia's jurisprudence. And in keeping with the theme of this evening, I'm sure many in this room may have differing views about him. But one of the things that I admired the most about Justice Scalia was his ability to dissent vigorously while maintaining genuine friendships with his colleagues. The secret was actually pretty simple. As he put it in one interview, and this is my best Justice Scalia impression and it's not very good, I attack ideas, I don't attack people. And I think the best evidence of that was his friendship with Justice Ginsburg. She often told the story of their interaction on the VMI case, which was decided the term before I clerked for Justice Scalia. As you may recall, Justice Ginsburg wrote the majority opinion, holding that VMI's denial of admission to women violated the 14th Amendment. Justice Scalia issued one of his classic dissents, contending that the question should have been left to the democratic process. It was a lone dissent. That opinion was decided seven to one. But I think the words that he wrote capture perfectly his theory of jurisprudence, regardless of whether you agree with the result in any particular case. And this is the only longish quote I'm gonna to read to you tonight, because I really do think it's a powerful one, at least in terms of explaining how Justice Scalia approached the law. He wrote, much of the court's opinion is devoted to deprecating the closed-mindedness of our forebears. Closed-minded they were, as every age is, including our own, with regard to matters it cannot guess because it simply does not consider them debatable. The virtue of a democratic system with a First Amendment is that it readily enables people over time to be persuaded that what they took for granted is not so and to change the laws accordingly. That system is destroyed if the smug assurances of each age are removed from the democratic process and written into the Constitution. So to counterbalance the court's criticism of our ancestors, let me say a word in their praise. They left us free to change. The same cannot be said of this most illiberal court. Now, those were very strong words. But just, Justice Ginsburg's response was not to take personal offense. Instead, she later wrote that her majority opinion, quote, was ever so much better than her first, second, and at least a dozen more drafts, thanks to Justice Scalia's attention-grabbing dissent. And Justice Scalia didn't just dissent from the justices who leaned to the left. His most famous dissent was in Morrison against Olson, where he dissented from the opinion joined by every single one of his colleagues in upholding the independent counsel statute. He likewise penned a wonderful dissent in 2014 about whether police could pull over a drunk driver based on an anonymous tip, and where Justice Thomas had written the majority opinion upholding that search. He accused Justice Thomas and the majority of, quote, serving up a freedom-destroying cocktail of Fourth Amendment violations. Yet I think it's safe to say that Justice Scalia and Justice Thomas retained their close friendship, and I think that all of us benefited from the chance to read their divergent viewpoints and decide the issue for ourselves. 
So this is just a long-winded way of saying that, yes, we may well disagree on many issues, but as long as we air those, disagree those disagreements honestly, I think it will move our society in a better direction. And it so saddens me that we will no longer be able to read any new Justice Scalia dissents. I fully expect that in the coming years, we're going to have our opportunities for disagreement. And I also fully expect and hope that when we disagree, we will likewise recognize that each of us is equally committed to the success of this nation, even if we have different views on how that success should be achieved. We see much of that playing out already. One of your most distinguished colleagues, who I mentioned earlier, I'm not sure if he's here tonight, but Neil Katyal, and I are currently on opposite sides of very significant litigation concerning President Trump's executive orders on immigration. I have no doubt that Neil believes in the justness of his position. And lest there be any doubt, I can assure you that I am equally committed to ours. But I implore you to follow this case closely because what I believe you will find is lawyers engaged on both sides in vigorous and heated debate, but respectful and civil debate about these enormously consequential questions. And I firmly believe that having committed, professional, and vigorous advocacy on both sides of the question is what at the end of the day produces the best results, both in law as well as in life. Let me close with a few words about the Office of the Solicitor General, which I have the high honor of leading. For roughly the first 80 years of this nation's history, the Attorney General operated alone, with no department or aides around him, and often while maintaining a private law practice to supplement his government salary. I wish that we were still allowed to do that. <laughs> his decisions, moreover, were often ignored by the attorneys of the various other executive departments. Shortly after the Civil War, Congress responded by creating the Department of Justice and the Office of the Solicitor General. The only two officials named in that original act were the Attorney General and the Solicitor General, who the statute provided must be, quote, learned in the law. And it directs the Solicitor General, along with the Attorney General, to argue cases before the Supreme Court in which the United States is interested. People sometimes ask who the Solicitor General's client is. That can be a complicated question. But as Justice Scalia would remind us, the place to look for the answer is in the text of the statute. And the text of the statute charges the Solicitor General with representing the interests of the United States. I'm so honored to follow an extraordinary group of public servants who have represented those interests over the years. The first Solicitor General was Benjamin Bristow. He was a Civil War veteran who prosecuted members of the Ku Klux Klan. Other early Solicitor Gen Solicitors General included titans like William Howard Taft, John W. Davis, and Frederick Lehman. Solicitor General Lehman best expressed the ethic of the Solicitor General's office in words that are now inscribed in the halls of the Department of Justice. And they read, quote, the United States wins its point whenever justice is done its citizens in the courts. Among the many great solicitors general to follow that creed were Thurgood Marshall, often hailed as the greatest lawyer of the 20th century. Robert Jackson, one of the greatest writers in the history of American law. Erwin Griswold, a dean of Harvard Law School so respected that he was appointed by President Lyndon Johnson even though he was a lifelong Republican. And I should also note that Erwin Griswold was a partner at my former law firm, Jones Day. And more recently, several of the most formidable advocates that I have seen argue in court, including Ted Olson, Paul Clement, and of course, Justice Elena Kagan. Those are very big shoes to fill and I know I've got my work caught up, uh, cut out for me in living up to them. But as many great lawyers who have held that office, the most legendary argument given 
by the Solicitor General's office was not given by the Solicitor General himself or herself. It came from Deputy Solicitor General Paul Freund. In the mid-1940s, Deputy Solicitor General Freund watched his, watched his opposing counsel endure such difficult questioning that by the time the argument of his opponent ended, the court had essentially made all of the government's arguments. So Mr. Freund stood up and gave this, the sum total of his argument. May it please the court. There is a typographical error on page 10 of our brief. If there are no further questions, the government will rely on its brief. And he promptly sat down. Justice Frankfurter later said that he had heard many learned arguments. He had heard many powerful arguments. And he had heard many eloquent arguments. But he had only ever heard one perfect argument. <laughs> and that was it. I don't think I will have a chance to try that out this term. And I, and I don't think I'd have the courage to do so, even if the opportunity arose. But I will take the Deputy Solicitor General's point that you should quit while you're ahead. So let me thank you again for your invitation and so much for the support that you gave to me personally throughout this process. I am grateful for the chance to be with so many people committed to their ideals and to serving others. Our profession is stronger and it is better because of your devotion to the rule of law and to the nation that all of us love so much. So thank you and congratulations on such a successful convention.